Wedgeside Podcast is a proud member of the Wedgeside Media Collective. This week's episode is brought to you by Anonymous. Not that anonymous, but an anonymous person. Anonymous wanted to challenge other listeners to donate to sponsor an episode for something that they care about. To sponsor an episode is super easy. It's only $10, but we will shout out whatever you want with that $10. So if you love a restaurant that you think needs more attention, sponsor. If you have an organization that you just love, you can sponsor and shout out what they're doing. If you are releasing an event, if you have an event going on that you're, you are putting on yourself or that you just like, sponsor an episode. If you have a new product you want to promote, sponsor an episode. And send us a sample. Yeah, well, we, I mean, we take samples <laughs> and bribes. <laughs> I mean, that's what a sponsorship is, right? It's a bribe. Yeah, totally. Yeah. No, but they just wanted to challenge other people to get out there and, and actually help sponsor the show, which I think is amazing. So thank you, Anonymous. And you can do that by going to whichidepodcast.com. Click on the Donate tab. This is episode 126. Yeah, we talk with Andrea from CABS, which is the Committee Against Bird Slaughter. And they also have a new documentary coming out at the end of this month, I think the 22nd, Yep, called Emptying the Skies. We have a, a link to that so you can check it out. It's amazing. I didn't know anything about this organization until I watched this documentary. And the best way I could describe what they do is sea shepherds, but for the air. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, they're out on the front lines, destroying cages, destroying traps, uh, getting beat up by hunters, shot at. It's pretty crazy. What news and events do we have going on this week, Jordan? Well, on April 18th, there's the New York Anarchist Book Fair. On April 22nd, the documentary Emptying the Skies is coming out, which we'll have a link to. And April 25th is the Bay Area Anarchist Book Fair. For the slingshot this week, April 6, 1968, the Oakland police murdered Black Panther Bobby Hutton. We talked a little bit about Bobby with uh, M1 on -hmm. the last episode. If you like what you hear out of the slingshot, you can pick one up from your local info shop. If you don't have a local info shop, you can always start one or pick one up from AK Press. And they could really use your help right now. Yes, they can. I sincerely hope you enjoy this episode. How's your day going so far? Oh, well, uh, it's 4 o'clock a.m. I'm leaving for Cyprus, and uh, the, the mood in the pre-Cyprus day uh, is never so cheering. So, no. yeah. so yeah, you're just going to Cyprus for uh, your next campaign in Cyprus? Yeah, is that exactly. Right? Yeah. yeah, tomorrow morning, for 4 o'clock, I'm leaving for Cyprus. It's uh, the first one-week pre-camp, and um, yeah, normally we get a bit depressed before the camp starts, you know. Understandably, for sure. Yeah, you know, I wasn't too familiar with, I shouldn't say too familiar, I wasn't familiar at all with what you guys were doing um, here in the United States uh, until I watched the documentary, which I, I just had a chance to watch, which was just fucking amazing. Like, I, I got to tell you that. I, I really oh. take my hats off to you guys for being out there literally in the trenches for this. Yeah, it's a pretty tough thing. Uh, fortunately, in Cyprus, we, we managed to make things better. Now it's not so crazy as it was at the time when we um, when we did the documentary with uh, Roger and Douglas Cass. Uh, but still, the, the atmosphere and the mood is never so happy and, uh, yeah, relaxed there. Yeah, well, we kind of just jumped right into it. Do you, would you mind kind of explaining um, what you guys do so our, our listeners actually know what we're talking about? Um, yeah, I mean, you, you mean generally speaking? Yeah, uh, yeah, what, just, what yeah. To- uh, well, we are engaged in anti- anti-poaching activities in Europe, mainly in the Mediterranean, so France, Spain, Italy, Cyprus, and Malta. 
we, 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 when we, um, and when the organization was founded, it was the anti-poaching was the main issue, mainly in Italy at that time. Then we uh, enlarged our horizon, and we found out that the problem was much more um, widespread than we expected. And the strategy, I mean, the, the, yeah, the strategy we u- normally use is being on the field. We, of course, we do some educational work. We do lobbying work in Brussels and the European Commission, local by local governments. Uh, we work on with laws and, um, um, yeah, movies, videos, uh, pictures, uh, sensibilizing people. But the main uh, w- character of our association is being on the field during the migration when trappers are around and try to prevent trapping uh, in by, I mean, with all possible ways and means, uh, which depends, uh, again, on the strategy we decide to adopt for each country, uh, depending on the political uh, and law enforcement situation there. You know, what I kind of took away from it was a, like a good analogy from what you guys do is you're kind of like the sea shepherds, but for birds. Yeah, we have been called like that a couple of times. (laughs) (laughs) I agree. Which, yeah, yeah. Yeah, For for me, that's a huge compliment because I love the Sea Shepherds too. I'm a huge fan of their work. Yeah, we too. We too. I mean, we are some sort of cousins. Uh, They are much, much better known. We are pretty much smaller, actually. And uh, we were not very famous before Jonathan Franzen discovered that, let's say. Uh, even if we have been doing this job for uh, 20 years now and with a uh, big deal of success, mostly in Italy. Um, yeah, the strategy, I mean, we, uh, we've been uh, told, uh, we've been said a bit aggressive in, in the way we try to prevent trapping and trappers. But um, in fact, uh, we think that this is the most, uh, the most effective strategy on the field. One, one of the questions I had watched in the, the documentary, this is just something that sticks in my head, is one of the means that they used to to trap a lot was lime, lime sticks. sticks yeah. yeah what the fuck is that yeah i was going to ask that the lime sticks yeah um well there are two different traditions in europe with lime sticks uh, it's pretty widespread in the mediterranean they use uh, uh, a glue uh, which they um they, they put them on on these small sticks sticks come from uh, olive trees or uh, granite apple trees uh, and they put this lime on it. This lime can be done, can be um, synthetical, like in France and Italy, for instance, or can be natural and done with the juice of the Syrian plum tree, uh, with some honey and some other ingredients that we don't really know. Uh, I can tell you, it's pretty sweet. Um, yeah, and then they just uh, use the instinct, instincts of the birds to perch on horizontal um, twigs. Uh, so the bird sees the twigs, which is uh, horizontal in the, in the bush, and just perch on it and gets stuck. Hmm. Yeah. It. 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 I was just like, what the hell? So it's like a. It's like a really sweet. Does the sweetness attract the birds as well as uh, stick them? No, no, it doesn't. It doesn't. I, I, we know that because uh, I mean, uh, our the way we uh, save the birds is by sometimes licking the the. the the uh, the stick the yeah the sticky sticky glue from uh, from the wings with our tongue or the lips so we we feel it's it's uh, sweet and we know that even trappers uh, do that the same thing to get the birds uh, and we know that they use honey but they also use some some strange things where I don't even know, want to know what they are uh, to make them uh, so sticky and to resist and to to uh, last for um, they can last until six months or even one year wow. sometimes. Holy yeah. crap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have seen them doing sticks in summer and use them until January. So when, February, when, you, uh, when you... And they usually store them. Oh, sorry. I was going to say, when you find the sticks um, out in the field, do you destroy them or take them? Or what? what is your like protocol with those? Oh yeah. Well, we, we the first time I was I was in Cyprus it was in 2001 and then 2002 again, then 2008, 9, 10, 11. These years our job, our task was to find the lime sticks, monitor the trapping site, destroy the lime sticks, free the birds. This, this was the main the main the main issue. Uh, but of course the situation turned more and more tense every year and um we understood that without uh, a police or law enforcement agency with us 
doing prosecution work, it wouldn't, uh, the situation wouldn't change. So now, if you ask me, I mean, in the last three years, 2012, 13, 14, um, we have been uh, taking the police to the trapping sites. And yeah, okay, sometimes we just collect the lime sticks together, but usually we want them to uh, ambush the guy who's trapping the trapper, uh, catch him red-handed, and then remove the lime sticks themselves. So recently, I've I haven't touched so many lime sticks like before. The first year, it was 4,000 in one week and two weeks. Wow. Yeah, huge numbers. So, so you say you've been doing this for 20 years. When exactly did trapping birds become illegal in Europe? Oh, well, it has al always been illegal. Uh, in, in Italy, bird trapping uh, was, I mean, a different, there are different methods and traditions, and there are different dead end, uh, dates uh, for each tradition. Uh, I don't want to make it too, too complicated, but uh, some trapping methods were illegal uh, already in, uh, by the end of the 19th century. And in Cyprus, in Cyprus, we're talking about 1970, more or less, it was in the in the 70s, when uh, the use of lime sticks and mist nets um, turned illegal, according to their own law. So, like, it, it seems like they just made it illegal, but there was no cultural uh, change to want to enforce it until you guys really got onto the ground. Is that kind of correct? Yeah, that's uh, perfect. Exactly correct. We we uh, when we make when we make jokes, we usually say that Cyprus is a trapocracy, uh, not a democracy. And uh, the other joke was that uh, in Cyprus everything matches the, the the frame, but the law against trapping, uh, meaning that everything it seems to be done to allow trappers to do their job, but the law. Um, Police uh, units in Cyprus had nothing against trapping. Judges had nothing against trapping. Magistrates had nothing against trapping. I mean, I'm talking about 10 years ago. It, the, the law was there, but no one was really uh, implementing it. Uh, there was a sort of balance between authorities, um, I mean, uh, the public opinion and trappers to protect and uh, to protect this, this form of this activity. And we were the, the grain in the machine, which made the machines collapse somehow. So w what is, what's your origin? Um, like what brought you to, you know, fighting for animal rights and, and specifically for, you know, the, the migration of the birds? I, I, since I was very young, I was pretty in love with wild animals, mostly mammals. And uh, at the age of 15, I was given uh, binoculars as a present. And since I had no driving license and I was living in the middle of the city, the only wild animals I could see were birds. And this is how I gradually fell in love with them. And uh, when I was uh, about 19, I found out that there was uh, an association here in Italy called the League for the Abolition of Hunting, a pretty radical group. They were doing some activities in the Alps, uh, north of Milano, where I uh, where live. Uh, to save birds from traps. And uh, well, when I thought about trapping, I had in mind something like Canada or Alaska. We have uh, David Crockett or these exotic things for us. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't, I couldn't imagine that here, just 15 minutes from my place, there were hundreds or thousands of traps for, well, uh, robins, thrushes, small birds. And uh, yeah, the first operation was great. I was really, I mean, I was young and enthusiastic uh, and just... Uh, roam the mountains up and down and destroy traps, free birds was uh, amazing, uh, amazing adventure and really rewarding. Um, and it was there where I know I first knew um, CAPS groups. They were called the Germans because uh, it was a very, very small organization at the time, just uh, 30, 40 crazy volunteers was coming over the weekend from Germany to save birds and destroy traps. And then gradually we, we came to know each other much better. And yeah, I, I had the chance to expand the horizon by um, taking the group to Cyprus the first in 2001 and then to Sardinia here in Italy and then gradually to Malta, uh, then France, Spain. So um, I was in, at the time I was the one who, were, who was trying to explore Europe uh, more and finding new old traditions to um, tackle. Do you ever run into any troubles going to these other countries with them knowing what you guys do? Uh, yeah, uh, we had lots of troubles. 
And it's it's like I mean I mean personally I was uh, I was shot at a couple of times once in Cyprus and once in Italy, and um, uh, I was uh, I mean I got some rocks around me uh, thrown by a poacher in Italy again. Uh, my car was shot while we were driving down, and then I was attacked uh, a couple of times in Cyprus together with some other guys. Uh, it's pretty, it was pretty. There, there is a phase. Uh, Phase when you do this kind of job when trappers think they can scare you off by uh, trying to kill you or at least uh, uh, threatening you. Uh, we usually did really usually it lasts uh, three four years and then they also change, change strategy and uh, turn much more clever by and doing some political job and not only scaring off volunteers. So you're saying if you can not get killed for three or four years, you can make it through it. <laughs> Something like that. You know, <laughs> Well, it's really like that. I mean, in Italy, uh, we've been working some 10 years and the first five years were terrible. I mean, at the very beginning, they don't understand who you, what you are doing. They think they can just continue, keep on doing what they've always been doing. And so they don't really um, don't bother you and you don't really bother them. It's just an accident in their in their history. But after the third, fourth year, they see that you're coming over and over, that you are disturbing them, that you are damaging their business and uh, screwing up their business. So they, they turn really aggressive at this time. Everywhere, first in Italy, then in Cyprus, then in Malta, then in France, we've seen that this moment comes when they are really, really crazy against you. But then after that, they see that they don't win the war because we insist and insist, and then they turn much more strategical and try to get the politics on their side, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Well, in the documentary, um, you guys showed a bunch of different ways that people trap. Were there other ways that you didn't get a show? Oh, well, I don't remember exactly now. Uh, we have shown the, uh, the stone crash traps in France. We didn't show the snares. They use snares in Sardinia and in France. In Sardinia, illegally, and in France, legally. So small snares, uh, well, with a, with a bait, the bird tries to get to the bait and get uh, strangled. Mm -hmm. This is a um, pretty, pretty cruel method. And then there are the... And where you have seen the mist nets in the video, but you don't see the um, uh, ground nets. So sort of the two big nets that uh, they're clap nets. They're called clap nets. So there is someone that triggers them and they close and catch all the birds that are sitting on the ground or feeding in that moment. This is another typical traditional uh, method of trapping in the Mediterranean. And then I think that should be uh, all because net traps i think you uh, they are showed in the video in, in the documentary snap traps are also small round traps that are used normally for mice and voles but uh, in italy and uh, in france and in portugal they are also used for birds if you put not uh, not cheese but uh, not not some some bread but if you put um, a worm you can do a birds that's hmm. i was going to say you show like the stone traps and stuff and Obviously, there's a lot of traps where the birds can't make it. Are there are there certain traps that are easier to save the birds from? Oh, the best, uh, the best. I mean, the, the trap I love the most because it allows me to to free the birds unscathed uh, are the mist nets. Mm -hmm. uh, mist nets, great. If you get, I mean, snap traps, they are all dead. Stone crash traps, they are dead or badly injured. And snares, they are dead. Uh, well, the, these clap nets, they are triggered by a person, so you cannot approach the side because you find a poacher there and it would not be very non-confrontational. Uh, so, yeah, I would say mist nets is the only trap you can uh, free a bird from easily. So, if, if we're, I'm out in the woods and I come across one of these traps, what's the best way of taking care of them? Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Well, I, probably without any organization behind you, without any political, strategical work, uh, the best thing you can do is to get, to remove the net and save as much as many birds as possible by, by removing the net, the, the trap. Uh, but, but of course, the, we all, this is the, the first thing that we try to do. Um, but of course, if you have built up some sort of cooperation with uh, law enforcement agencies, then, then you can set a hidden camera, remote camera, and try to get the face of the poacher, uh, call the police and ask them to make an ambush. But it's not that easy. Uh, this is the problem. These laws in Europe, they are there now some 20, 30 years, but there are very, very few police officers there uh, who are ready to, to implement them. 
even even just uh, two days ago, we asked for uh, we asked the forest forest police to intervene on three nets we have here in the forests of Brescia again, and they said no, we are not making any ambush. Uh, these are the local police forest police officers, so they just uh, refused to do their job because they don't consider it uh, important enough for uh, to spend uh, out one day in the rain or yeah. So you see, it's not easy. Yeah, I would say here in the United States, for pretty much any form of of hunt sabs, it's never viewed uh, positively by the law enforcement, whether the actions are illegal or legal that you're trying to to stop. You know, um, law enforcement here just hates animal um, rights activists. I would I would say is a fair statement. Yeah, uh, you think? I mean, you know, where in you in America? You mean on New yeah, York? yeah, 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 in the United States. In the United States. Oh well, I, I don't know the situation in in the United States. Uh, I but I know. I mean, we always look at you as an example of uh, real law enforcement in 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 I mean uh, regarding uh, in relation to uh, wildlife crimes. Uh, I think it was in the USA where you had this uh, robot deer uh, which were left uh, roaming around the main uh, roads to see if hunters would stop and and shoot at them. Uh, did, did you know this case? It was a pretty funny story. Yeah, they, they do little things like that, but um, those are all law enforcement activities. So mm -hmm. uh, if for activists, though, that are trying to stop actions, they, they frown upon. They don't want activists doing anything. Any kind, yeah. yeah. Well, not, not that in Europe they really want activists to do their job. We had also to, to build up our, our name at the beginning, we were seen like, uh, you know, exactly, Sea Shepherd, crazy people, violent, uh, radicals, uh, uh, destroying traps, destroying uh, even legal hunting blinds or this, this kind of thing. Uh, but then after a while, we, we we managed to to convince authorities that we were doing what they were supposed to do by writing reports and yeah, um, attending meetings, official meeting of um, governmental bodies, um, police forces, writing projects together with them. It was really a process which is still ongoing. Uh, yeah, I think uh, probably United States don't know something like that. I'm not really confident with that. But yeah, if, you're, if you consider, you think activist is still a word which in Italy and in Europe is considered in bad terms. Activists are people under out of control, destroying things, doing taking justice in their hands, uh, um, which in my opinion is not wrong if it's done with brain and uh, consciousness but uh, yeah you have to build up really a name and a fame on that uh, well i agree with you it's not wrong <laughs> but <Yeah. laughs> um w was there ever a moment that you kind of just sat back and realized i'm pretty fucking radical compared to a lot of other people <laughs> uh yeah i mean uh, yeah we have to agree on what means to be radical uh, we might be radical. I mean, we give importance to, importance to something or to someone that other most of the people don't don't give a shit for it, uh, which are birds and also nature in itself, biodiversity. And even those who uh, who care for biodiversity environment, they don't really uh, engage themselves um, proactively in the field to protect it. And most of the Environmentalists in Europe, uh, they just um, yeah write essays, sit in the desk in front of the the computer and say and write or say something, but they don't risk anything. They don't take any risk. So in this uh, respect, we can be called radi radical. But um, I mean, we don't think we are saving uh, uh, the nature. We don't think that uh, we are cru crucial. We just do what we think it's really important to do at this moment. Yeah, sometimes you you know you just. Uh, Hunters kill legally uh, 100, 100 million birds every year. We cannot do anything against them. Uh, it's legal. Then there comes a hurricane or, I don't know, a storm during migration and uh, millions of birds are killed. Uh, so that's, that's what I mean. I don't think we are sort of, sort of uh, heroes in these terms. We are, but, but it's difficult to, to stay with hands crossed in front of a slaughter that you can prevent and you can do something against it. I was going to ask um, if you've ever found any other animals that like that weren't birds that were caught in these traps. Oh yeah, many. We have uh, we had a chameleon once. No, not once. A couple of times. Great chameleon in lime sticks that we found. We mm. found snakes in nets. We found uh, uh, geckos, uh, lizards, um, 
I think that's all. Just uh, mostly reptiles. Oh, yeah, and lots of um, hedgehogs. Hedgehogs oh. in Cyprus, yeah, they also put nets around the, the villas, around the houses uh, to prevent snakes from entering the, the, the plot. Um, so in these nets, uh, bo um, ground nets, the, every possible animal gets stuck and tangled. Uh, and yeah, in some cases we, we managed to save the snakes and uh, hedgehogs. Hedgehogs are pretty cute there. They have very long uh, ears and so cute. Amazing. <laughs> hedgehogs are very, very cute. So yeah, are, yeah, yeah. Are, are these ground nets, are they legal to use that they're, they're using just to stop all wildlife from entering a plot? Well, we get we get to these nets because we want to see what is inside the plot, meaning lime sticks or nets. Uh, I mean, real mist nets, I mean, trapping nets. These nets on the ground, uh, they are they live in a gray zone. It's not legal because you are killing wild animals which are formally protected, like hedgehogs, snakes, uh, lizards, geckos, etc. Um, but uh, since you are not doing it on purpose, but you are trying to defend something, it's really difficult to to tell you if it's legal or not. I mean, strictly it's not legal, but uh, I, I think I would never find anyone uh, ready to do something against it. I mean, um, anyone, meaning a police officer or mm -hmm. whatever. Yeah. So what's been like the, the most memorable moment um, out in the field doing this for you? No, oh, yeah, lots of them, lots of them. Uh, they, they, these moments really, uh, Living my dreams and my nightmares, uh, so I have a, a whole list of moments. I remember once it was pretty nice. I, we were, the first time we went to Cape Pila. Cape Pila is the hotspot for mist netting in, in Cyprus. It's part of the British base, uh, and the British police not doing uh, any prop. And so we entered this area, uh, not not fence. It's just a uh, agricultural area. We entered this area with the car in the night, and uh, uh, me and my friend Dino, we were dropped, uh, driver left, and exactly at that point, a car uh, popped up, and we knew it was a trapper's car, pretty dangerous in this area. This is a mafia, mafia area, uh, owned by the mafia. So the only thing we could do was just lie down on the ground. There was full moon, no crop in the field, so it was bare ground, and, and the trappers just... Uh, uh, left the car, stepped off the car and waited there 15 minutes looking around to see if there, someone was moving. And I had the feeling I was completely visible there. Uh, so we spent these 15 minutes thinking what, what the hell would happen next, if they had spotted us or not. Uh, yeah, it was a very memorable, memorable moment. And I really hated the moon that night. <laughs> so uh, kind of along that, what's like some of the worst encounters you've had with trappers? The worst, sorry, the worst? The worst encounters that you've had with trappers? Um, the worst, uh, yeah, but I think, uh, well, one, one, one night they really shot at us. It was uh, pretty uh, in the same area, more or less, and they they heard the noise of the nets we were dismantling, and uh, and the trappers uh, just aimed the, the the shotgun to the to the noise and shot. It was just bullets, oh, but it was pretty pretty close. And uh, yeah, I felt I felt the bullets uh, uh, bumping on bumping on my on my bouncing, sorry, bouncing on my on my neck. Um, I don't know. I really I never had a, a real uh, direct aggression with knife or with shotguns very, from very from close proximity. So I don't. I re, I'm wondering what would happen if they they have weapons. We don't have any weapons. They are aggressive. We are always we take in a pacifistic uh, pacifistic attitude. So I don't know what would happen. We try always to down, down uh, the, they escalate the violence. Uh, still, I don't know what would happen. Uh, I, I, I mean, imagine that in some, under some circumstances, they could really uh, even kill you. They could have, because now the situation is pretty different. You know, it's one of the reasons that I've always had such admiration for people that partake in hunt sabs is just for that same reason. You know, you never know. You're going against people out in the field who you're disrupting what you know they view as a business and they're armed um so it's very easy to have aggression you know escalate very very quickly yeah actually you're i mean you're right uh, not everybody uh can uh handle these situations and uh um yeah i told you my, my mood is not so heavy so 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 nice today because i know that i'm getting again stuck in this situation um, some of us didn't, didn't manage to, to, to keep on doing this kind of job. They got some, some sort of stress and, uh, yeah, um, sort of, uh, 
feeling to be tired. Um, but uh, if you, I mean, I feel, not more, many of us feel that if we are not there in the front line doing this job, nobody's doing. And somehow we feel uh, obliged, we feel forced uh, for, for birth sake to, to, to help them. So I wouldn't really sleep at night if I'm not there in the spring knowing that they are trapping and I'm not uh, helping them. And this, uh, this uh, knowledge, this, um, I mean, this um, knowing that makes, gives me, gives us the strength to, uh, to face these situations. You know, you, you mentioned getting prepared to go again right now. What, what does that really take to get prepared mentally to have <laughs> to face these atrocities and know that you're putting yourself right in harm's way? Well, there is a trick. I think this is, uh, uh, this is the trick. The trick is that uh, we, we have a database uh, in Google Earth with all the points and all the history which every point uh, has recorded. And by looking at these points and uh, remember, every, recall everything that had happened, and I, this sort of curiosity um, shows up. And I think I would like to know this year what will happen here. If we catch him, if he stop trapping, if, uh, I don't know. This is the only uh, recipe I have against this uh, stress, the pre pre departure stress. Has there is there ever been like um, one of the people that put the traps out that year after year just like I really just want to catch him, I want to get him to stop, um, but you just took like so like a long time for, and it just you got that amazing feeling when it finally happened. Like you know maybe it took three or four seasons to finally get one trapper to stop. Um, I'm afraid that most of the trappers that have stopped now, uh, it's just because they are dead. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, some story, we even know some stories. Uh, I, I cannot tell you, I should go home and say, and, uh, and say, hello, are you still alive? I'm, I mean, um, I can't I can tell you that. I know it from another, another girl. Uh, we, had, we had a big uh, trapping issue in Italy on, on the Strait of Messina between uh, Calabria and Sicily, where um, um, raptors migrate. And uh, this woman was called, is called Anna Giordano, and she started doing the same job, protecting the, the raptors, migrating over the strait, and, um, because hunters were there to, to, to shoot them. And after, I mean, after 10 years, a man, an old man with his son came to her and said, you know, we met here 10 years ago, and you told me that one day I would stop shooting birds, and I would enjoy looking at them with binoculars. And I thought at the time it wouldn't be possible. Now I'm here with my son enjoying the birds with binoculars. So she is lucky enough to, to tell the story, to, 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 to witness the story. She, she made someone change his mind thanks to her passion. I, um, I, had, I have not come so far, unfortunately. I know that one trapper we met once in Cyprus, he had lime sticks in his hands, and instead of um, uh, taking off lime sticks from his hands, we told him, uh, I mean, a friend of us was um, speaking Greek, he told him, why I shouldn't do that, that it was prohibited, that we wouldn't take any action at this time, but please don't do it anymore because birds are protected, birds are endangered, are threatened, etc., etc. And I really, when, when he stopped talking, I said, well, I mean, you will never succeed. But indeed, since that day, I've never found lime sticks there anymore. So it seems that this speech had the sort of success. Do, do you find that most of these trappers are just of an older generation and the, the younger generations are kind of, you know, pushing pushing away the the tradition of it. I wish they were, but it depends on on the on the region and on the trapping tradition. For instance, uh, Cyprus, uh, those who use lime sticks are mostly uh, elderly people. Uh, yeah, so I hope that in ten years there will be no no more lime stick trapping. But at the same time, misnet trapping is done by young people. Um, most of them just uh, want easy money. Uh, black market, um, mafia people even uh, adding this business to other business. Uh, so there, really, you can you can keep up the struggle for 50 more years. And in Italy, we, you have areas where there are only older people. For instance, now in the island of Ponza, I caught three three people with the traps. Two of them, one was 93 years old, 93 years old, still setting out traps wow. for birds. The other one was 73. But the third one was 25. So uh, the new generation still have this uh, insane passion for killing birds. Uh, in France, uh, many elderly people trap Autoland buntings, but uh, we also had very aggressive young trappers, 30, 35, 40 years old. Uh, in Spain, it's mainly old people, 
in Malta, in Malta, it's, well, mostly young people are doing this, this, um, this um, poaching. How do you know where to find the traps? Where they find the traps or where we find the traps? Where, where you find the traps. Oh, uh, well, um, lots of years of experience and, um, um, well, I think we have some sort of talent for trapping, <laughs> for traps. <laughs> Uh, you really, you really see that. For instance, there are guys coming to us, and they went out. They go out one day, find nothing. Second day, nothing. Third day, nothing. After a week, say, "Guys, I cannot find anything." And then they just fade off. Uh, they just leave the group. But there are other guys that you feel from the, you see from the very beginning. They have a smart eye for traps, and they, wow, amazing. And the second day, they start finding traps, and they never stop finding traps. It's like, uh, like dogs. There are dogs that are good for, uh, for, for I don't know for. <laughs> Uh, drugs uh, and dogs are not good. We are those who are good, probably. So you, you talked about uh, the mafia being involved in this trapping a lot. Um, wh why? Like, what? What brings the mafia towards this? Is it? Is there just that much money involved in it? Well, in Cyp uh, mafia is involved in trapping in, in Cyprus. Uh, there are three, at least three groups, uh, mafia groups, uh, in three different districts. Uh, by the way, God bless you <laughs> for the cough. <laughs> yeah, Jordan just just ran away coughing for a second. <laughs> I had the coffee coffee fault. Right. <laughs> okay, uh, no, three, three mafia groups are running this business in Cyprus. In Cyprus, uh, the black caps, uh, Ambelopulia, are sold for three, four, five euros each bird, and in one morning you can get up to seven hundred birds. So Holy just imagine God. how much. Yeah, exactly. The, the deal, the business, it's about 15 million euro per year. And uh, the mafia has a big interest in this, uh, in this trade. Yeah, it's unfortunately a huge deal of money for them. So, I mean, just the fact that the mafia is involved, does that ever just kind of make you go like, holy fuck, I'm going to get killed? <laughs> Yeah, uh, at the very beginning, we had no idea the Mafia was involved there. We even drove to the trapping sites of the Mafia boys, and uh, there was something different, meaning uh, in five minutes you had five cars and 20 guys. <laughs> and we wonder wow. how the hell they can come so fast here just for a couple of mist nets and 20 birds. Then we, uh, the, I mean, the, the longer we were working there, the, the more information we got, and then we found out that this was the place of the Mafia boys. And so we then we realized that we were running, uh, we were risking it very, very much. Now we are doing it a bit more, smart, I mean, uh, more smartly. We uh, we check the trapping sites in the night by as a walking without cars so that they cannot spot us, and then we report these trapping sites to the police, which allegedly should make special operations on these sites. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't do. But it's amazing. I mean, the same trapping spot site has been raided let's say six times by the police with prosecutions in the last five, six years, and still they're using this one. It's like um, there is no, a never ending story there. Um, so, so rewarding. Um, so um, the profits are so high for trap, bird trapping that if you do it on a large scale and professionally, even if you are, if you, if you're fined 10,000 euro, which is never the case, almost never the case, you can still make a, a plus at the end of the season. Yeah, you, you just brought up being, you know, like the the possible fines that, and that was actually giving me my next question. It's like, when they do get caught, like, what do they actually face? Is it just a fine? Is it st steep jail sentences, no jail sentences? Like, how, like, what is the actual um, punishment for being caught as a, one of these trappers in Cyprus? Um, the average fine is between 300 euro and uh, 1,000 euro, more or less. Uh, around, well, maybe 1,500. Um, the second time should be something like 2,500 2, euros, and the third time should be around 5,000 euro. But it depends on how many nets you had, how many birds they found, how many, if they, you, had, you were using a tape lure. Um, but just just imagine, uh, yeah, professional trappers get let's say 200 birds in one morning. It's around uh, how much is 200, uh, 400, 400 euros more or less, 400 uh, up to 800 euros. So you just in one morning you pay the fine you get if um, you, you have to pay if you get caught. That just seems ridiculous, like low to me from the fines, like. 
Yeah, yeah, and uh, and uh, as I was telling you, the judges don't seem to be very sensitive on this issue. Well, right now, I was sending a mail to to a friend in Cyprus who is trying to 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 force the general attorney to uh, high up uh, the the fines because most of the judges there is no minimum in in Cyprus for the fine. So you can the, the law says up to seventeen thousand euro, but doesn't say if there is a minimum. So now I know that for, for sure that there were some cases with people trapping and they were fined only 150 euros, just uh, peanuts. And um, yeah, the problem is that uh, every, if the, the, I mean, big part of the society, at least in this district, uh, loves eating birds and politicians love eating birds and uh, magistrates, attorneys love eating birds. Everybody loves eating birds. They accept and tolerate and justify. This is what I meant when I said that the only thing that doesn't match the, fray, the, the whole picture in Cyprus is the law, because the rest seems to be, seems to agree that trapping must go on. Is so? Is it mostly local people that seek to eat the birds, or do tourists as well? Yeah, the market is mostly uh, is the Cyprus market or people from Cyprus, and not from the whole of Cyprus. It's mostly it's just uh, two districts. Um, I mean, three three districts: Larnaca, Nicosia, and Famagusta districts. But now we know that um, there are in Cyprus there are many Russian tourists, and we know that some of them are asking for ambelopulia in the restaurants. And it shouldn't be a big big part of the of the consumers. And is it? Oh, I was just say, is it, is that based like out of tradition, or is it more like uh, status? Like they, it shows like a, a certain status symbol to be able to eat the birds. Oh, well, now it's a status symbol. At the beginning, I mean, trapping goes on uh, from since uh, since uh, 16th century, probably at least, or even earlier. And it was because uh, because of Italians, as usual. Italians, uh, people from Venice, were asking, were trying to um, import uh, birds from from Cyprus. Cyprus was a, such an important flyway for birds, with millions of birds crossing the island, that they could get them there, store, and by sh- ship them to Italy. In the from the 15th century onwards, it became turned into a local market. Uh, old people get got food during migration, easy food during migration, proteins, thanks to the birds. Um, and uh, yeah, the problem was that in in the 60s and 70s, it turned into a real big big business. Money came. Everybody was trying could afford buying uh, ambelopulia in the restaurants. They introduced mist nets, which allowed a huge captures every day. And uh, if you want to show off, you have to invite people to get, to get in Belopulia. First, because it's traditional. Secondly, because it's prohibited. And third, because it's, uh, this, uh, yeah, it's, you know, um, yeah, it's a status symbol. At the end of the day, it's a status symbol, definitely. So so how do you think people know where to find these restaurants that sell them because they oh. can't promote <laughs> selling them? All, all of them, all of them. It's, uh, it's, it's like, it's no secret. And, uh, there is just a very small kiosk in front of the beach where we used to get our veggie burgers. And we, once even there, we found birds. Once even, I mean, uh, it's, re- it's really done uh, under the sunlight. Um, the police doesn't dare do anything to do anything against restaurants. There are less and less cases every year because uh, uh, if you go do something against restaurants, you really piss off people and you get the whole politicians against you. So. Um, we cannot. We, we are not able. We don't man, don't manage to to get uh, to the restaurants uh, with uh, with law enforcement. Uh, the, the best we've done so far was to go against trappers. That's uh, that's yeah. so. There. So everyone is pretty much openly legal illegally selling birds. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. That's the point. Yeah, so basically, no matter how many trappers you go for, since there's going to be a demand, it'll just make it more expensive, right? Exactly, yeah. Uh, well, we hope that uh, the more expensive it turns, the, the, the less people will be uh, ready to buy them. But um, as I told you, I mean, uh, everywhere in Europe, we've uh, tried to work on both sides, restaurants and trappers. Uh, usually we are much more proficient with against trappers because on the field we can do a different kind of job. Here in Italy we've also tried to work against restaurants. It's never easy because mm-hmm. there you really need a very a much a really engaged uh, uh, team of police officers. You have to go inside them. You get need a search warrant. You need political will. And uh, and even there then we have the, all the customers eating the birds and they will. Um, 
No, no, it's uh, really difficult. I, can, I just can tell you it's really, really, really difficult to get the police doing this job. So I, I know you guys focus mainly on like the European aspect of it, but most of these birds migrate down into Africa, right? Right. Is is it just as popular in Africa to trap these birds or is it mainly a European thing? We think that, uh, I mean, for, for the numbers, you know, these birds are uh, gathered during migration and in these bottlenecks. So it's particularly rewarding to catch them in these bottlenecks. It's like you have the whole population concentrated there for two, three weeks. And that's why tradition, this kind of tradition developed there. Mm -hmm. But uh, first of all, we are not covering all bottlenecks. Lebanon is still a huge bottleneck with huge trapping. Uh, Syria is also another bottleneck. Georgia is a bottleneck. And Egypt is a bottleneck because the Nile Delta uh, it hosts, uh, I mean, it's the only green area where all the birds from the Middle East are, are gathering. So, and, and what happens there after that? They, they just spread out in the Africa, in Africa. And we know they have to face lots of problems there. Um, um, people, villagers in, in, in the Black Africa are killing them with uh, traps, shotguns, everything. But uh, it shouldn't be so terrible because uh, birds are dispersed in, um, in, a, in a much bigger uh, scale area. In, in some of these other bottlenecks that you mentioned, like uh, Egypt, Syria, Georgia, um, Georgia like what is the like political climate towards the trapping? Is it illegal? Is it, you know, uh, frowned upon? And, you know, is it kind of like the same thing in Europe where it's illegal, but OK, or is it just completely legal? No, it's exactly it's exactly the same as in Europe. It's illegal, but OK. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you find the same attitude everywhere. Uh, it's I mean, uh, um, from uh, what I can say is that I find amazing that all these countries, without any need, they protected birds in, on the paper. I don't know why they did it. I mean, they had there was no no environmental movement pushing for that. Still, you if you look at the the law uh, the hunting law in Egypt, uh, Tunisia, Algeria, Morocco, uh, Lebanon, they are, they have great laws. Just five to ten bird species are huntable, and only in winter and autumn. So everything sounds perfect. But if you go there and look at what's going on, it's the mess. Uh, killing birds with traps, snares, uh, meat nets, uh, shooting in roosting sites, uh, millions all together. Um, yeah, and, and then the, the question is wh why the hell they did this law and then they didn't, they never implemented it. What, what, I mean, um, there is no, no answer, but the, the, fact that, um, the fact that nobody cares for birds uh, on, on the ground, they, Hunters and trappers are left alone on the ground and they do what they want. And politicians, even when they are aware of that, they don't want to step against it. Do you do you ever work with other animal rights organizations, whether on their campaigns or or have them help you guys with your campaign? Oh, yeah, we always do that. Um, at the very beginning, CAPS was just a German association. And when they came to Italy, they always supported uh, the local associations like WWF Italy, a league for the abolition of hunting uh, and other smaller association. So the, the strategy of CAPS was from the very beginning to go to a, in a country where there is a problem, ask, uh, offer support, try to to make um, a, a share the common plan and uh, and help with uh, financially with people, volunteers uh, or operations. And for instance, in, in France, we, again, Sauton Shopping, we work together with two other association, LPO and Cepanso. In Spain, we work with five associations, Spanish associations. They helped us giving all the materials, but uh, at some point, certain point, they say, we don't want to do that. Please do you, you do your part. We'll give you the information. You do the dirty job. In Cyprus, we have uh, also BirdLife Cyprus and uh, Terra Cypria. So also there, we are always try to uh, get embedded in the local strategies and um, yeah, planification. But at a certain point, if you see that it doesn't work, you also have to to get the upper hand and uh, and follow your um, you know, your concept. Have you ever worked on uh, any other animal rights campaigns while you've been working with cabs, like, um, but but not you know bird related? Sorry, I didn't I didn't get the word. If we were worked with other campaigns, what kind of campaigns? Yeah, like do do you personally ever work on any other animal rights campaigns that aren't necessarily related to cabs? Like, if you're not working on a cabs campaign, are you work? Do you ever work on other animal rights campaigns? Uh, no, I think it, uh, um, campaigns only with cabs. Um, I've done some some uh, work in the Amazon with uh, indigenous tribes. Uh, 
trying to help them in um, hunting issues, but this was not a real campaign. It was much more a project uh, uh, sponsored by environmental ministry, etc. So no, just um, we are expert only in birds and in the Mediterranean. So in the in the documentary, you say that the habitat of birds is already getting really bad and trapping just making it much worse for them. Um, what's the importance of birds in our natural world? Uh, birds, uh, well, if you if you read what uh, the scientific texts say, birds are important for pollination and important because they are food for other animals and, uh, and of course, they control pests, etc., etc. But in my view, this is not really the point. You don't, you cannot give importance to a, a species or to a, a category of, uh, of beings only because they, they uh, have a role in, in the, in in the nature and or, or because you think that they are useful for you for the human beings i mean birds are here have been here for many for millions of years they are part of the history and of the intelligence of our planet and they have to be here at least until i die <laughs> <laughs> then i don't know what happens but i mean it's sort of ethical question i cannot uh, live with the knowledge that there are no more birds or each species that dies uh, or gets extinct is an incredible loss for, for our planet, and uh, I wouldn't feel okay with that. And uh, yeah, can so, be the coverage. Uh, what, the really, what really drew you to birds as, instead of uh, focusing on any other animals? I think it just uh, it was a, a chance. Uh, as I told you, I was in Italy, uh, sorry, I was in Milan in my city. I didn't have any any chance to move around and uh, the first uh, category of animals I, I, I got to know and I, I found I had a problem and I could do something for them were the birds and then the, just the, the tie was uh, uh, was there and uh, the, the bound was there and uh, now I know that I have this role and I know I'm doing that right uh, correctly and uh, I just can I would love to go to Africa and save rhinos or uh, you know or to go to South America and save monkeys, which I know have big problems in South America, by the way. But it's um, sort of destiny. We met once. Uh, I know I can help them. No more, many more people are doing that, so um, I have to take care of them. Well, you mentioned that you, you did some work in the Amazon. Would would you want to expand on that a little bit for us? Yeah, sure. Um, this was I was in Ecuador at the time. Um, I was running a project. Uh, to help local tribes to develop a sort of sustainable hunting and fishing tradition. Because, uh, well, you know, um, modernization, they had medicines, uh, uh, flights, they, they had money, they could, uh, they had lots, lots, lots of children. The population was increasing amazingly. And the old traditions they have to kill all the animals and to fish all the fishes they could in the, in the forest was not sustainable anymore. So they were asking for, a, for some um, concepts, for some uh, strategies to implement, to, to um, change their hunting and fishing um, tradition to some, something which were more sustainable. And yeah, we, the, the only, this was the point. The, the point was to try to, to find a way to communicate to them, to, to transmit, to uh, give them some, some concepts and uh, make them understand the importance of these, um, of these um, solutions and make them adopt them or give them the chance to adopt them. Because every time you try to force them, someone doing something on his land, it's not so easy to, to succeed. Yeah. Um, yes, please. I was just going to say, so, so they reached out saying, hey, we know we have this problem. Can you kind of help us solve yeah. this problem? Was, was, uh, was it ever geared towards, you know, uh, other means of, of, you know, getting food, like maybe agriculture, plant-based, things like that? Well, in the Amazon, you cannot, uh, you cannot uh, develop big crops, plantation. Mm -hmm. They already had uh, very small orchards. We have uh, peanuts, for instance, uh, um, um, yucca. The, I don't know, <laughs> manioc, I think it's the name, the English name, manioc, yeah, or, or bananas. Um, but the, most of their diet came from uh, fishing and hunting, proteins came from fishing and hunting. Uh, and uh, either, I mean, they, yeah, or worms also, or um, hands, they also eat, they ate ants. Um, the, this, was, this worked as long as the communities were small, the forest was huge. But when communities grow 
bigger and bigger. And every family has 12 or 13, 15 children. Uh, then there is no solution, actually. I told them uh, there was no solution. What we can do is to postpone the crisis, but the, the crisis comes because you always have to keep a balance between the environment and the human population, and they were not doing that. Um, the other solution would have been develop tourist plan, tourin, touristic plans and, uh, yeah, import food, but it would uh, ruin and uh, spoil their um, way of life. Mm -hmm. What what was like uh what was it like working with them in the Amazon like uh, was there any like memorable moments that that kind of stick out to you? Ah, uh, definitely, it was very memorable. Yeah, it's uh, it's like so it's like you get to know the whole humanity. You you get in touch with uh, with someone who can tell you how it was the life two thousand years ago, and and you recognize that we are part of the same family group that we think the same things. It really um, made me discover the common root of uh, human beings of different cultures it was really a really rewarding experience uh, I, I really i still love these these guys i'm still in touch with them we um we visit them almost each every year in the amazon and uh yeah i also have their memorable experiences bad and good ones the bad one is when they, they shot a monkey in front of me and i saw the monkey falling down tumbling down from this from, from the tree and then i had to carry the dead monkey to till to the village Oh, uh, yeah. So still, it was not exactly the, the kind of life I would select for myself. But yeah, I mean, you had to understand that uh, it was a different part of the humanity, um, meaning uh, with different patterns, different under different conditions. Yeah, very emotional. It was really great experience living there. And also you learn to live uh, without anything. Uh, I mean, with very few things, without light, without energy, without uh, um Canes, <laughs> cane food. Um, yeah. Um, I know that sometimes when you're when you're out, um, you sometimes find animals that you're unable to save, and they're they're just so badly injured that they need to be put down. Are there ever cases where you find maybe a bird that can't fly, but you're able to take it back and save it? Uh, well, um, the problem was we had this problem at the beginning with the robins in the uh, bow traps. The bow traps um, destroy, they, they break uh, badly both legs of the robins. I mean, one one or two legs. And uh, every time we had to take the decision, either we leave the bird fly without legs uh, or just cut the legs and let the bird die in one week. If it was just one leg, it was easier. Maybe the bird could uh, survive. Sometimes we thought uh, they better bring them back home and give them antibiotics uh, for because I mean, the, the injury was bad if you, if you cut a leg of bird. Um, yeah, I had, uh, I had at least I have uh, 10 or 12 memories of birds that I, I found on the ground uh, on in traps injured. I brought them back home. I helped them for, uh, let's say, one or two weeks, and then I managed, managed to, to let them free, uh, fly free. And one of them is the, the, was last autumn. It was a whole finch, very beautiful bird. We found, uh, we found him, uh, her. We found her. Uh, shot in a hunting blind was a protected species and we kept uh, her home for one or ten days and then at the end it managed to fly and I have seen her again in the nature reserve here uh, one week ago so probably she really managed to survive in the winter that must be an amazing feeling to to see you know see her again and just get that that you know one-on-one -on -one of like I really made a difference you know what I mean yeah, yeah, I know what you mean, of course. Uh, I have another story. I, I remember also a chaffinch that uh, we uh, we saved from, from uh, it was an orphan bird, and then uh, we let him, uh, her again, it was a female, we let her fly in July, and we found uh, her again in, the, in my feeding station in January. Uh, it's, it's like I have the feeling that I have lots of uh, grandchildren around <laughs> in, in, in the world. <laughs> Yes. Uh, sometimes I look at them and say, "You might be my grandchildren." If if I'm being your grandfather, if I've saved your mother, then I, you can I can call you my grandchildren. Yeah, but this is this just increases the engagement. I know uh, I have uh, now I have the the feeling I have to save all the birds because they are not just cute, nice, and lovely, but they also are a part of my family. Well, I gotta tell you, you guys are out in the trenches 
trenches actually doing the work, saving these animals, raising the awareness. And you have my total respect. I mm -hmm. totally love what you guys are doing. Um, would you Thank mind you. like telling people how they can follow your guys' work, get in contact, help with you, and then also uh, about the, the premiere of the documentary? Yeah, I didn't know about the, the premiere of the documentary. Well, when it will be, will be uh, well, premiered? I believe they were saying there's a worldwide premiere April 20th. I think so. We'll, oh. we'll, we'll find out for sure and put it in the show notes. Okay, great. Yeah, because I'm not really up to date here in Italy. Um, well, we have a very nice um, um, uh, website, which is www.comitee.de, like Germany, Deutschland, uh, where uh, there are all contact details. The, the page is also in English. Uh, so, yeah, where you find information, how to subscribe, uh, if you want to make a donation for our camps, uh, it's possible there. Uh, on the other side, I think that the fact that um, that many people look at the video, enjoy the video, and uh, talk about the video, spread the voice, and make pressure on authorities, governments, and I mean, this must be uh, something that everybody knows. It should be something like C. Shepard has managed to do, something that everybody talks about. Uh, until 10 years ago, it was really a very a matter of uh, few people knowing the trap, bird trapping. Now, slowly, thanks to Jonathan Franzen and, and thanks to the movie um, Empty in the Skies, now it's really something people are talking about. And this helps a lot because we don't find a wall when we talk uh, with the governments, with the European Commission, with the Convention of Bonn, of Bern, uh, international things. Uh, so this is, I think, the best way people can help us, watching the video, talking about it, and looking, watching, having a look at the website and maybe making a donation just concretely to help uh, increase our camps. We're trying to make more and more. Now we are not only in spring, in Cyprus, also in autumn. Now we are doing also winter camp. We're trying to be there all the time to cover the longest uh, period uh, of migration and of bird presence there. Well, thank you again for all the work that you do for the animals. Um, again, like I said, that's just so much respect for me for that. Um, we end every episode saying, fuck shit, damn. Would you mind saying it for us this week? Oh, sorry. You want me to say fuck shit them? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I said it. <laughs> <laughs> Can you say it in Italian? Uh, ah, okay. Wait, wait. Fuck shit them. Uh, it's difficult. It should be fottuta merda dannata. Fottuta merda dannata. <laughs> Sweet. Well, thank you so much. You have, yeah. Have a wonderful <laughs> weekend and uh, okay. best of luck on your campaign in Cyprus. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you again. Right. Have okay, a bye. good one. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. This week you heard Loud Pipes by Ratatat. Right now you're listening to Pink Elephants by Tristiza. I like pink. I like elephants. Yeah, make, it's a song made for us. Totally. Yeah. iTunes. Rate and review us. We did get one ghost subscriber last week or not ghost subscriber, ghost review last week. Uh, we did say the first person to do it would get a free DVD. That person's not going to get a DVD because they're sitting in front of me. <laughs> so go write a review. Look at that ghost review. You can see what we mean by writing a ghost review. And we'll reach out to you and get you a free DVD. That's an animal rights related DVD. You'll enjoy it or not, but you'll have a DVD for free. So, a ghost review. All you need to do is steal someone's device and review the podcast on it. Give us five stars right on there. I stole this device. Giving you five stars. Here's my ghost review. Get a free DVD. Don't literally steal their device. Just borrow it. Yeah, just be like, hey, you got you got an iPhone? Let me see it real quick. Pull up their podcast app. Subscribe to which side? Search for us. Hit rate. Write a review. Five stars. Boom, 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 boom. Free DVD on your way pretty simple if you haven't yet liked or befriended us on our social media you should do so we often say things on there that we don't talk about on the show by often that's every day on a daily basis so be our friend go to whichsidepodcast.com click on the social tab and find all the social media that we have fuck shit down sure which Side Podcast is hosted and produced by Jordan Halliday and Jeremy Parkin of the Which Side Media Collective, with web design by Jordan Halliday and sound design by Jeremy Parkin. Booking by Mari Halliday. Theme music by Commandantes.
Go to wishsidecollective.org to check out the other shows in the collective. As always, fuck shit damn.